This podcast is not safe for work and will feature movie spoilers. It will feature scenes described of a graphic nature. It will contain language which most listeners may find offensive. Welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. Hi everyone and welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. This is episode 469. I'm your host Duncan McLeish. Welcome to the show. Up on this episode we're continuing our countdown on my top 10 favourite horror movies. Accurate up to the date of the 31st of August 2023. At which time I reserve the right to change anything in this list. Any way, shape or form that I want. Now, you might be asking why I would have an elaborate introduction where I would put forward such a clause, such a statement. Well, it's because we are mere days away from celebrating our 10th anniversary as a podcast. And you guys out there, via the Facebook group page, selected that I do a rundown of my top 10 favourite horror movies of all time. A list that is nigh on impossible for someone like me to do. So as a result of that, I've decided to be a little bit quirky and a little bit fun with it and put that caveat in there as a get out of jail free clause for me. So I can assure that during the 10 days that this season runs, these are my favourite horror movies and everything before or after that is subject to change. Now, if you haven't checked out yesterday's episode, please go back and check it out. It is available wherever you are checking out this episode. So if that is by the the medium of the video on the YouTubes, then make sure you check it out and hit us a little subscribe while you're at it. If it's on Spotify, checking us out via either the video or the audio, then make sure you answer the question that has been posed to you um, in the show notes. Or if you're checking us out anywhere else, then make sure you subscribe there to take advantage of not only the new episodes we're dropping, but also the back catalogue of over 1,200 episodes strong. That's right, we are closing in at 10 years anniversary for podcasts under the stairs and I'm doing the thing that I told myself I never would do which is ultimately doing one of these silly lists of favourite horror movies. Stopping off at number nine is something a little bit more conventional but let's be honest not any less controversial because this movie has a uh, has solidified its place as one of the highest grossing horror movies per the amount of money that was spent on it of all time. It redefined the idea of what could be done within the horror genre on a micro budget, but it burst a brand new genre. Granted, it existed marginally before this, but you know, kind of set out the template of what to do, and it's still going strong some, what, 14, 24 years after? It was originally on our screens. It caught the imagination of horror fans and normies alike with its genre trending and forward thinking viral marketing campaign. It is, of course, The Blair Witch Project from 1999. Welcome back. So, The Blair Witch Project from 1999. Joining me is my trusty iPad. It has all my IMDb on it, which will save me looking away too much. Uh, and hopefully will save me cuts and edits on these videos. Yeah, the movie came out in 1999. It is, of course, directed by Daniel Merrick and Eduardo Sanchez, who co-wrote it together alongside 
who is also uncredited the main actress in this movie, um, Heather Donoghue, who stars in the movie amongst the micro cast of Joshua Leonard and Michael C. Williams. Uh, there are some other folks in here, but those are mostly very, very, very small bit parts for sure. Synopsis is listed on IMDb as three film students vanish after travelling into a Maryland forest to film a documentary on the local Blair Witch legend, leaving only their footage behind. iPads going to the side. So, The Blair Witch Project, a movie that has um, ultimately went through a bit of a renaissance and then a bit of a uh, retcon of feelings of sort. Because if you speak to hardened, chiselled horror fans now, a lot of them who live through the Blair Witch phenomenon will tell you that they never were actually scared of this movie. They always knew it was just a movie and they don't see what all the big fuss is about. Being someone that lived through that time period and never wavering on his opinion on the Blair Witch Project, I can assure you that a whole lot of those people are talking straight up bullshit. Um, this was a movie that, when it landed, had a massive impact, scared a ton of people, and did that whilst essentially showing nothing. Really not doing much except planting small ideas in your brain and watching the reaction of what felt like real people being terrified to the core. A very, very simple idea and premise, but executed at a level well beyond the filmmaker's should-be ability of the time. The Blue Witch Project is, for the most part, a revolutionary kind of movie. It's not the first found footage movie, in fact you will hear people mention Cannibal, Col uh, Cannibal Holocaust, which I would argue isn't really a found footage movie, although at the same time it is a movie in which people find footage and then watch said footage, it is still very much a you are watching a movie and it is passing itself off as a movie. Man Bites Dog is another one that's used in that kind of environment which is really a kind of faux documentary, which I believe there is a, a spread between the two, between movies that pass themselves off as a documentary filming something, and that just happens to be a mysterious thing, uh, or has a mysterious outcome, and those which are claimed footage which has been found. The Blair Witch Project falls into that second category, whereas a movie that came out six months before in the last broadcast, which is also, you know, ahead of the Blair Witch Project, uh, falls into the first camp. It's a full documentary. It's a movie that purely plays itself off with the tone, tempo and uh, temperament of a documentary. It just so happens to not be real. Another way of looking at this would be that Paranormal Activity is a found footage movie in that it's footage that was filmed and then played as part of an investigation, whereas a movie like Lake Mungo is a documentary which examines footage. Lake Mungo being a full documentary, Paranormal Activity being a found footage movie. So I think there is a clear divide. Blair Witch Project falls into the found footage category it doesn't have anyone saying you know, the movie you're about to watch is or you know someone examining the footage at all rather it has the statement at the start saying that some students went missing in the woods the footage was filmed and here is the footage played linearly linearly in a straight line right through the idea that feels really simple it's something that people can gravitate to but in both instances of film footage and full documentary, the best ones are the ones that after 10-15 minutes, you kind of forget you're watching a movie and you are absorbed into the environment presented to you. So if it's pitching itself as a documentary, you're watching it like a documentary. In the case of the Blair Witch Project, you're invested in the mystery because the mystery feels grounded in some way, shape and form. I would argue that over time, found footages went a little too fantastical in parts or a little bit too gimmicky that maybe it has lost some of that impact and that's not to say that they are all like that. This year a popular movie which I imagine will make a lot of end of year lists 
um, is Outwaters, which is a movie I thought was pretty bad, if I'm honest, and it's going to do quite well, but it's the the typical to me uh, gimmick found footage movie. All gimmick, no real substance at all there. The Blair Witch Project, because it doesn't really show you anything, it is kind of relying on you believing the scenario that these kids have found themselves in, and it's a simple one at that. We have all been lost at one time or another, whether it's as a kid or as an adult, the feeling of being lost is unnerving, um, it, it gets under your skin and it is a creeping feeling. It's never one minute you're fine, then the next minute you're lost, oh fuck, what are we doing? It's always that feeling of, am I lost? When was the last time I saw a road? When was the last time I checked my watch? When was the last time I called someone to let them know where I was? All these things start to to creep in. It's the creeping doubt. And creeping doubt, I would argue, is what the movie kind of sets out in its modus operandi and its delivery. Is that all the steps throughout this movie, as another thing is realised or another action or another conversation is discussed, ultimately the audience gets a little bit more of that dread of where are they? Well, actually, maybe they did cross that bridge before. What did happen that night when the noises were happening? Could someone be playing? Could someone from the town be playing a prank? Which is always in the back of your head. Which obviously the movie culminates in a scene which to this day is still open to a degree of interpretation. Some people have what they believe is a very clear end, kind of written out. The others have a different feel of what that ending is. And I would say that the filmmakers themselves never went out their way to establish either as being canon. Rather, the sequels to the movie itself are the ones that have delved more into the mythology, rightly or wrongly, either causing more consternation as a audience member trying to parse out exactly what the mythology is is and how that may actually have an impact or an effect on the the movie you watched before or just because the filmmakers themselves in the previous Blair Witch movie uh, which was the direct sequel to to the, the first one um, being a movie which is so infatuated with the ideas and concepts of what the Blair Witch might be that it kind of starts filling out its own mythology, which some people will roll with, some people absolutely despise. And once again, that's fear. The Blair Witch Project, the original movie, doesn't really give you that much. And as a result, it kind of leaves a lot of wiggle room to do things. It's also probably its greatest asset. Like I mentioned before, the simple premise here is the three college students are doing a thesis project for school. They're going to do it on a uh, urban tale, that being of um, the Blair Witch of Burkittsville. And to do that, they need to go into the woods and follow along these certain checkpoints throughout the folklore tale of the history of the Blair Witch. They very early on encounter people from the town and through interactions there they are kind of given an idea of the scope of belief of the townspeople as to the, the mythology. Some believe it is an old wives tale, some believe they actually have seen weird things and then at some point it gets linked back to a, a kind of unsolved serial killer case which is eventually solved kind of too late in the day and that the person they eventually capture for it has uh, kind of done his grand design of murdering these children. He claims that the Blair Witch told him to do it. So that once again, setting out the, the, the kind of scope of stuff. Now all this ha stuff happens right at the beginning and it's quite smartly done because about 15-20 minutes later you're not thinking about that, instead you're grounded with people who are friends but are friends by virtue of the fact they have a project to do together. Now we've all been at school or college or university or at work where you're forced into a group and inevitably you realise very very quickly that if it was not for this group you would never socialise with these people, you don't have anything in common. Those groups usually devolve into those that are there to have fun or try to find fun in what they're doing. Those that are trying to keep the group together and of course inevitably the alpha 
of the pack who will try and assume control of every decision and micromanage every step. In the case of this movie, Heather is that character. A lot of people don't like this movie and I feel like I'm always addressing the hate of it, but a lot of people don't like this movie because her character is deeply unlikable. FYI, that's what that character is there for. You're not supposed to like Heather. You're not supposed to feel sympathetic towards Heather. I would argue you're not really supposed to feel sympathetic to any of these kids after a point. The way they interact, the way they treat each other, the actions they take throughout this ultimately mean at one point or another in this movie you'll kind of just switch on them and when that happens you are kind of strapped in maybe rooting for them to get out but at the same time realising that they never do. That's another thing the movie does really well. It tells you at the beginning that they were never found and this is their footage. So you are watching the inevitable descent, decline and mystery of these three teenagers. If at the end of this movie you'd found them all dead, then that solves the mystery of what happened to these kids in the Blair Witch. Um, but you don't get that and that's the genius of it. At no point do they actually show you a body. Rather, what they do is show you things that make your brain think you know what you saw or what is going to happen next. But it sets out its stall right at the start. This ain't going to have a happy ending. It's not going to have a satisfying ending. If it did, there would be no need for the movie. Rather, be prepared to watch a mystery. And at some point, something's going to happen and this footage is going to be filmed and we don't know what happened. So now, enjoy. It has a, a a great sense of pace. I mean, this movie is under an hour and a half long, which is perfect for a movie like this. I feel that some found footage movies of recent times have been pushing over an hour and 40, which feels unjustifiable to me. I think an hour and 30 feels like a good run time for a movie like this. Also, on top of that, what you have is a lot of getting to know the characters at the beginning. A lot of dealing with the Tim's folk, but within 10 minutes we're in the woods and that's us for the next hour and 10. Um, we see that relationship break down and the slow realisation of how they're being lost parsed out really, really well. You are still like 15, 20, maybe even 30 movies into this before, 30 minutes into this before the movie starts throwing weird curveballs at you that maybe something isn't right, maybe a noise has been heard, maybe we've walked past this area before. What's this doing here? Like small fractures in the relationship of the characters, which later on will play out when we come to the end. I remember seeing this in the cinema, it's a famous story, I've told many times on podcasts under the stairs, and the motion sickness overwhelmed me as to such a great degree I actually passed out in the cinema um, and I remember being wholly confused when I came back in and walking out of the wrong screen and, and inevitably not really missing much of this movie but by the end of it I came out still feeling like I'd seen something genuinely jarring, unsettling and unlike anything I'd seen to that point. I think if you were to go as a kind of teenager now and go back and watch the Blair Witch Project, it probably wouldn't have the same impact. The reason behind that is the genre has almost hot-shotted every variation, trick and trope it can possibly do to the nth degree. The actual Blair Witch Project might come across as being a bit pedestrian and that's kind of sad but at the same time that happens in all genres. It used to be that the life cycle of a popular genre lasted about five years. If you look at the Italian Jallos, the Slashers, the Supernatural Booms, the kind of Satanism stuff, and in the 90s, the Psychological Thriller, the kind of heydays of those, even the resurgence of the Slasher movie, the heyday of those were four or five years where they were super, super popular and then audience kind of felt like they'd seen everything because filmmakers had tried everything and when they pushed it beyond that, the audience lost interest. Nowadays that's not always the case. When you look at movies that deal with found footage, that genre has been relatively consistently active now since about 2005-2006. So we're coming on about 17 years where there is always a big old handful of found footage movies. It's the same with the post-apocalyptic zombie movie, 
we feel like since they became popular with uh, 20 Days Later and what, 2003, 2004, um, when that movie came out, it kind of reset the barometer again of how people are going to take to those sorts of movies. And now we are like over 20 years on and we are still getting many like of the dead, like last of the earth, like here's another zombie post-apocalyptic movie. So those those trends have went longer and longer. Blair Witch Project is really the precursor and not immediate. Like as successful as this movie is, in 2000 and 2001, people were not rushing out to make found footage movies. It took a bit of time. They slowly trickle out from about 2002 onwards. And it's not until the Blair, the Blair Witch Project is... I suppose maybe the sequel bombing as hard as it did maybe had an effect to that, even though it's not a found footage movie. But it takes until about 2007 with Paranormal Activity for the genre to really become popular again because that movie does hella large numbers like the Blair Witch Project did for its minuscule budget. The overall beauty and why this movie is a favourite for me is that I feel it does so much with so very little. It has a limited cast of what feels like kind of almost theatre troupe actors who are really pushed to the edge. It's filmmakers trying to do something that hadn't really been charted before in a way which feels like I mentioned like above a competency level of where they should be in their career. Neither filmmaker has done a movie which has been as popular or successful as the Blair Witch Project and I think there's a reason behind that. Of the three actors in this movie Heather Donahue still does things and has been involved in projects. One of my favourite being the Steven Spielberg produced science fiction anthology well it wasn't even an anthology it was a series wasn't it, it was an anthology in that it jumped through different time periods um like each episode was set in a certain like year range but it dealt with the roswell and it was called taken and it was absolutely brilliant and she plays a relatively dislikable kind of bossy micromanage sort of character in that as well so you kind of feel like she was typecast from the blair witch project possibly but no one really went on to do huge things from this movie. But I also argue that no one really needed to do any huge things. Blair Witch Project will be a movie that whenever people compile the top 10 scariest endings to a movie, Blair Witch Project will be in that top 10 or at least in the discussion to be in that top 10. When people talk about movies that terrified people in the cinema, Blair Witch Project will always get mentioned in that sentence as well. And at this stage now, I don't think there's much of a chance there will be many movies ahead of the Blair Witch's claim as being one of the most profitable movies ever made. It's just the nature of the beast. To me, the reason it elevates to the, that favourite status is that to this day, I think it works. I think the movie works on several levels, even if it doesn't necessarily give me the same chills and spills that it did back in 1999 when I saw it in the cinema. I feel that I still am intrigued by the story, the dynamics of the characters, what I think the ending means, the bits where I think I can see the exact points that relationships break um, are ultimately the exact moment in the movie when I know they're doomed. I love that about this movie and it keeps my attention all the way through. It is guilty of a few trend-setting tropes that are a bit long in the tooth now. The idea and concept of why in a found footage movie certain people carry cameras well beyond their means. This movie has that. It kind of set out its stall early on in a way which doesn't feel satisfying and has become harder to justify the longer it's went on. The inevitable apology scene. That's been done to death in found footage movies where someone is apologising that they've dragged everyone to this place where the bad things are happening and also the kind of start start drop end a found footage movie can only really finish in a way where the end cannot be explained if it can be explained it's not a mystery and as a result it's not satisfying this movie gives you that there's a great found footage movie called uh, Murder, Death, Koreatown 
and it's a really cheaply made movie. It's on Amazon Prime in the UK, at least. And it follows a, a recently unemployed guy's preoccupation with a cordoned off crime scene that he passes one day close to his property and his slow descent into there's a conspiracy behind this. I think it does a really good job of detailing out how internet conspiracy and also on some level the need nowadays to make sense of things that in the past people would have just taken as that's the way the world turns so you might as well hold on and hope you're not swung off. Um, that movie slowly, it doesn't increase the scares, it just slowly increases the mystery so when the scare does come towards the end of that movie and ultimately the final shots being the way they are, they work really well because you don't expect them coming. The Blair Witch Project, and the reason I mention it, the reason I give it all the credit in the world is it sets up some pretty lofty scares and then really does leave the best to the end. The last shot in that movie is fucking awesome and it's, it outdoes everything done in the movie before of which there were loads of things that worked. So... Fair play to them. There's a lot of movies that give you a lot of scares in the middle and then it comes to the end and then you're like, huh. Movies like The Borderlands, for example, um, that's a movie that definitely sticks the landing in the found footage category. It's another movie that's a found footage movie, but, you know, it sticks the landing with two feet firmly planted in the ground and works really well because of it. The Blade Works Project, to me, is a movie that, like I say, I don't think I need to sell anyone on it. I think there's a lot of people have forgotten how effective it was. Time will do that for sure. For those that still enjoy it or claim to still enjoy it after seeing it years ago, that's awesome. For those that have fallen off the bandwagon, that is also awesome. Because guess what? This is my top 10 favourite movies and not yours. That, ladies and gents, was movie number 9. The Blair Witch Project. So... Uh, what is left for you to do is, if you're checking us out on the Spotify, um, answer the question. What do you think of the Blair Witch Project? Of course, you can always interact over on the Facebook group page, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash cast. And that, as they say, is that, ladies and gents. Of course, the podcast under the stairs will be back tomorrow with number eight on my list. Make sure if you're checking us out on the YouTubes, yes, subscribe. If you're listening to us in any podcatchers, subscribe there as well. It really does mean you'll get access to everything and everything that is to come. All that is left for me to say is wherever you are, whatever the time zone is and whatever you're up to in this big bad world of ours, please take care of yourselves out there. This is Duncan McLeish broadcasting live from under the stairs and I am signing off.